Professor Fo is a professor at Faculty Built Environment and serving in Director of Low Carbon AG Center UTM. He is registered town planner and chartered member of Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport of Malaysia. He specializes in climate action planning, urban sustainability, environmental modeling, transportation, housing planning and management. He previously served as project manager for Low Carbon Society for Asian Region Satellites Project and has done notable research and climate action plans for Kuala Lumpur City for Putraj Corporation, Penguin City, and, and local authorities within Iskandar Malaysia region and five pilot Malaysian cities funded by Global Covenant of Mayor's Brussels. So his presentation is titled Science-Based Climate Policy Making at the Local Level in Malaysia. Lessons learned from collaborative work among universities and research institutions. <laughs> Professor Fo, now the floor is yours. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Chairperson. Uh, and thank you very much to Watanabe uh, Sensei and Tsukamoto, uh, Dr. Tsukamoto. Nice meeting you again in the web uh, symposium. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to wish everybody a good afternoon. Konnichiwa to all. Uh, let me uh, share with you uh, my slide. Uh, can I have the... Can you allow me? Okay, good. Uh, can you see the slide now? Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, important uh, symposium and um, especially to knowledge share uh, on this uh, so-called science-based climate policy making at local level in Malaysia and our focus on lesson learned from collaborative work among universities and research institutes together with uh, policy makers. And of course, um, as mentioned uh, by Watanabe Sensei, uh, the main theme of this research is very much more on the linking of climate change action with sustainability. Uh, I also take some time to, uh, to uh, describe the new ways of building sustainable Asia uh, after COVID-19 in the case of Malaysia. And uh, today's discussion will basically cover uh, three main areas. Uh, one uh, is introduction. I will cover basically on the Malaysian commitment on LCS. Two lessons learned, very much more on the Iskandar Malaysia uh, case study, Kuala Lumpur and more, uh, one of the royal and heritage town. And thirdly, I'll go into COVID pandemic and impact in Malaysia and the way forward, how do we integrate this climate action plan into this uh, pandemic uh, issue. And uh, today, many of my discussion will be actually outcome from the inter international funded project, uh, Substrate. Uh, we call it a Science and Technology Research Partnership for uh, Sustainable Development. This is funded by JICA and JST Japan. And uh, this research is interesting because it's a unique partnership between academia and policy makers, whereby uh, it help us uh, to develop a low carbon society blueprint uh, to guide us a pathway for how to develop uh, a so-called low carbon society in Asia uh, region. And uh, this, this lesson, uh, really this project really offer a valuable lesson to many Malaysian cities as well as uh, Asian cities in advancing this scientific research and also importantly to put this policy into action. Uh, I'll start off with um, this uh, recent 
carbon emission target. Malaysian, uh, Malaysian as a so-called upper middle income nation is pursuing a rapid uh, economic growth to become a developed high income nation and is still conscious about global commitment for environmental protection as well as climate change mitigation. The country have made a, a commitment in reducing 45% uh, uh, of its uh, reduction in terms of density by the year of 2030 uh, using the base year of 2005. Many of the cities, uh, notably Kuala Lumpur, Putrajaya, Moa and other uh, cities within the Iskandar Malaysia have prepared a low carbon society blueprint and they have, much, uh, they have set much higher target, uh, more than 45%. Uh, uh, that's the national target. So, and I must say that Kuala Lumpur city in particular is now preparing their Kuala Lumpur uh, master plan or we call it structure plan here. And uh, they are even aiming for carbon neutral by the year of uh, 2050. We know that actually uh, many Asian cities are facing uh, urban problems. And uh, these urban problems are not only uh, experienced in Malaysia cities, but also in ASEAN cities like Jakarta, Manila, Bangkok, Phnom Penh, which are also experiencing kind of uh, very rapid urbanization and industrialization. And all these cities are experiencing congestion, pollution, urban heat island effect and sprawl. And I think uh, we need to tackle them or we should take this opportunity to tackle them with a low carbon solution um, uh, or from a climate change uh, perspective. Uh, we, can, we can actually look from uh, low carbon material energy flow. We can look into the possibilities of using uh, green mobility or active mobility. And we also should uh, take the opportunity to look into green economy and, and still keep city as an engine of growth for the nation. And we should also look into possibilities of green lifestyles or sustainable communities uh, for Asia uh, in this near future. In the case of Malaysia, at the national level, actually, we as an emerging nation, urbanization is still rapid, as I mentioned earlier. The focus is very much more on the green technology application in urban development. And the government have uh, seriously looked into uh, LCCF, Low Carbon City Framework, um, and um, the very recent one is the Green Technology Application for the Development of Low Carbon Society, and uh, as well as a lot of renewable energy and energy efficiency initiative. So these are things that the Malaysian government are, are focusing at the moment. With the Paris Agreement, actually, uh, or COP21, the global community signal intent to act and this is where collaborative work among experts and policy makers are important. Uh, the collaborative work not only between uh, city to city, but of course, it also between the local and the international experts. Uh, we know that every city is uh, facing a different or specific uh, vulnerabilities to climate change and have different opportunities to mitigate the effect and to build resilience. So in this exercise where science to action, where we can use the science to action evidence to explain based on the inventory or data modeling to show the impact scenario and formulate climate action strategy and some opportunity for us uh, or for the stakeholders to take action on climate change and to make low carbon society a reality. So if you look at uh, in terms of the process and design, uh, the science to action, of course, we started with baseline inventory, scenario development, uh, GSG modeling, community stakeholders engagement, policy framework. This is the first stage where science to policy making take place. Then we have to move into the polit political and corporate uh, buy-in, mainstreaming, capacity building, and policy roadmap. This is where I think policy making are translated into action. And then uh, many of our cities are now also moving into tracking, monitoring, reporting, and uh, policy review. So uh, in the case of Malaysia, we approach this um, with integration of so-called stakeholders engagement, or we call it focus group discussion, FGD, whereby the stakeholders, uh, a kind of bottom-up approach where they participate in issues and fact-finding as well as the possible local wisdom or local solution to 
to the uh, problem. And uh, all these processes, uh, we really need to consider the farming goal. It has to be pro-growth, pro-job, pro-poor, and pro-environment. I think this is even more critical in this COVID situation, whereby I think jobs and poor are facing a lot of issues and a lot of problems. This is also because the developing countries are still looking for a balanced approach uh, for environmental friendly and a development sound solution. This is where I think science to action uh, into, should look into harnessing the science and technology sustainable development approach into uh, solving our problem, not only to mitigation target, but also uh, co-benefit as well as vulnerability and risk reduction. As evidence in Malaysia, we can see that the 11 Malaysian plan and our long-term shared prosperity vision 2030, we are really promoting strongly on the resilient, low carbon, resource efficient and socially inclusive development. From the Malaysian experience, actually, uh, uh, we can go uh, in two main options. One is actually by preparing a climate change plan as a standalone one, or two, by using uh, mainstreaming into this uh, so-called statutory plan. So the project which I'm going to describe later, actually, in the case of Iskandar and Kuala Lumpur, we have uh, prepared a separate low carbon society blueprint to decarbonize the existing statutory plan. Uh, so that we can achieve the reduction uh, in terms of carbon emission. But in our uh, uh, new case study, in the case of MOA, uh, District Local Plan, we try to incorporate decarbonization process into a local plan preparation. And by doing this, we believe this could be one way forward to accelerate the preparation of low carbon uh, or climate change uh, reduction plan in Malaysian cities. This diagram basically shows, uh, uh, there are two uh, uh, diagrams here. One uh, on the left-hand side is a sign alone, whereby we try to decarbonize the existing development plan. And the right-hand side is how we integrate the climate action plan uh, into a development plan. So you can see that the combined plan um, on the right-hand side, where we have a spatial dimension in the development plan, that is the pink color one starting from development plan, going to planning permission, and then enforcement of feedback. Whereas if you look at the low carbon or climate change development uh, cycle, that's the yellow color one. We start with initiation, planning, and execution, and assessment. And uh, this is where uh, we try to do the mainstreaming, uh, the process of spatial planning and low carbon uh, planning. In mainstreaming this climate change, as I mentioned, there are four stages, initiation, planning, execution, and assessment. We start off with the, with the forecasting uh, of emission level using uh, modeling. Uh, in fact, in this case, uh, we use a lot of uh, uh, in modeling that developed by NIES, uh, ESS model uh, to, to, to model uh, our baseline. Uh, using population, economic growth, transportation, and waste, and then followed by uh, the planning stage where we look into action and initiative that can contribute to carbon emission. Then later part, we move into execution stage where we plan action are formulated based on the roadmap. And then uh, ultimately, we will move into assessment. And this is a continuous monitoring process that has to be carried out. Um, from this very uh, last five to 10 years, actually, um, I would like to sum up very quickly uh, a few messages that uh, I'd like to convey today uh, before I move into the detailed empirical case uh, that uh, I will discuss later. There are uh, five points which uh, we summarize here. One is city in Asia still play an important role of uh, uh, we recognize it's a, it's a CO2 emitters and, and we still have to plan it as a competitive and engine of growth for the nation. 
But the most important that we should aim at the co-benefit for climate change action and focus on decoupling of CO2 reduction and economic growth. Secondly, the good scientific research is important uh, component where I think research institute uh, like NIES, IGS or UTM should, should work together with policymakers in collaboration. The third point is the evidence-based policy supported by multi-stakeholders engagement are effective. And fourthly, the mainstreaming of low carbon society into the development plan will be one important way to accelerate climate change. And, and finally, the inter internationally funded collaborative work between city to city collaboration are essential and important. And this finding actually is based on our very early uh, work uh, in, we published actually in this Enabling Asia to Stabilize Climate Change in 2016. And this book actually uh, is edited by uh, Nishoka Sensei. I think for those people who wanted to know more about uh, this lesson learned, how do we go about to enable Asia to stabilize the climate? I'll move to um, the case study. Uh, but before I move to the case study, I will just basically show us that uh, the center that we have, we have established under the Step Step project, so far we have worked out about uh, 10, more than 10 cities, and we are talking about close to about 73 million tons of carbon emission reduction that we have. And today we will cover three uh, case studies. One is uh, Iskandar, Malaysia, uh, the southern part of uh, Peninsula Malaysia, which is just next to Singapore. We are working on 58% uh, uh, reduction in intensity. The second case study actually is uh, Kuala Lumpur, the state capital. Uh, this state capital uh, is the biggest city in, in Malaysia and uh, we are aiming to achieve a 70% reduction in intensity and then uh, the next one we are taking another medium uh, sized cities that is Moa and the reason we chose uh, the medium sized cities because I think many of the Malaysian cities are within this kind of population range of 200 to 300,000. So we are working uh, on these three uh, or uh, I'd like to, to not share with you these three cases. If we can do uh, some good planning for this kind of range of cities or this kind of region, probably we could uh, share this knowledge with uh, other ASEAN countries in terms of their methodologies. Um, with that, I'll move, I'll move to the first case study, Iskandar Malaysia. Uh, Iskandar Malaysia actually is chosen as a pilot study because of its rapid urbanization and industrialization which is actually similar to many Asian countries, uh, whether in, in Indonesia, uh, Thailand, or Vietnam. Uh, we believe, actually, if we can decarbonize Iskandar Malaysia, we are able to knowledge share this methodology with these uh, Asian uh, experts. And the second reason why we choose Iskandar Malaysia is because um, we have five local authorities or five cities within the region. Uh, in here, we call it A, B, C, and uh, A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, in the case of A, is the CBD, is the administrative commercial center, uh, that is Jawaharlal City Center, and B is a is a kind of uh, new administrative center, uh, Nusa Jaya. We call it Iskandar Putri now. Uh, this is a new, uh, very strong, uh, livable uh, neighborhood supporting the, the main commercial center. And uh, C actually is an interesting part where this is the Ramsar site, where the carbon sink we are talking about and is an agro hub. We are supplying all the uh, fruits and food to Singapore and others. And then we have a D, which is the Eastern Gate, or we call it a Pasi Gudang here, it's a heavy industry. And uh, E is uh, Sanai or Kulai, this is an, another airport, industrial uh, airport plus uh, university town. So we can see Iskandar Malaysia is unique because there are five different characteristics of local authorities within the region. And it's a fast growing region. And if we are trying to find ways, if we can find ways to prepare a kind of climate action plan linking with sustainability for these five cities, we should be able to get some uh, lesson to learn from uh, this uh, case study. And um, broadly, this abstract project come up with two big objectives. One is we are trying to come up with a key policy and strategy to mitigate carbon uh, emission and to, to gear uh, this region into a sustainable low carbon metropolis with international standing, adopting green growth. <clears throat> the second important point is um, 
we have to help the, the government on national level to ensure climate resilient development for sustainability. This uh, work actually came up with uh, a, a, a blueprint. Uh, this blueprint actually are uh, working on the three main pillars, economy, we are hoping the nation to achieve a high income nation, looking into social inclusiveness, looking into uh, environment uh, sustainability. And uh, with that, uh, we drafted up about 12 actions and 281 uh, program. <clears throat> this in detail, uh, <clears throat> the 12 actions are grouped uh, into the three teams. Uh, first team is green economy. We are looking into transportation, industry, urban governance, uh, building, and energy system. And in terms of uh, community, we are talking more on the lifestyle change, the community engagement, and consensus building. And of course, uh, the other important one is the green uh, environment. We are talking more on how to come up with the workable city design, how to achieve a smart urban growth, <clears throat> how to have a green and blue infrastructure, how to achieve a sustainable waste management and the clean air for Iskandar Malaysia. <clears throat> and uh, this is done through a, a policy uh, scoping work. We look into the vision first, Iskandar to be a strong, sustainable metropolis of international standing. We look into the two keywords as strong uh, in terms of prosperous and strong in terms of uh, healthy and knowledgeable society. So if you look at um, strong in terms of uh, prosperity, we are looking into green transport, industry, governance, building, and energy. This will be the formation of the green economy. And um, the society part will be more on the lifestyle change and the community engagement. <clears throat> then from sustainability point of view or sustainable uh, dimension, we are looking more on the built environment, looking into walkable city, the smart growth, uh, rural, Resources. We also need to have a balance, uh, not only the uh, low carbon city, but also low carbon rural area, sustainable waste, and of course, uh, green air as an important component. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> here, uh, this is where the science come in. I think um, uh, inventory data collection are important, as uh, also I think mentioned strongly in Paris Agreement, all this need to be transparent. So we use data that uh, carbon emission drivers uh, from the master plan, comprehensive development plan one, uh, using a baseline modeling. As I mentioned earlier, we, we work closely uh, under the guidance of NIES, uh, AIMS modeling. And I think many of the NIES uh, experts are involved, namely uh, Dr. Gomi, Ashina, uh, Matsuka Sensei, of course, the head, <coughs> and uh, Matsui Sensei, and, and Jinosan, and there are many, many other uh, team members are inside <coughs> this, this work. And uh, we do a projection of <coughs> this city, a uh, baseline of 11.4 million, uh, projected to be about 31.3 million, expected to drop to 18.9 million with uh, uh, countermeasures uh, with planned climate change action. And uh, this actually <coughs> modeling provides us a very objective and evidence-based kind of uh, data for policy making. And uh, this also provide, uh, I think probably the first time a region or a city would able to understand carbon uh, calculation, uh, not at the national level, but at the city level. So this is one of the very uh, uh, landmark uh, research work, especially at the uh, local level. And <clears throat> as I mentioned here, uh, since this topic is on how this collaboration work between uh, science and policy makers. We can see on the left hand side, uh, the green color one is, I think this is where the science come in. Uh, Japan and Malaysian counterpart work together uh, uh, using data, using modeling, using best practices. And uh, in this case, uh, AIM model is mentioned here. And then we drop out our first cut of the blueprint. And then uh, through FGD, focus group discussion, uh, we came up with this plan. But uh, when we are doing this planning, we are also very conscious about the policy makers in terms of um, what are the current or existing uh, uh, institutional framework, what are the, the law or legislation that govern this. For instance, we are taking the Parliament Act of 664, 
Commission of Iskandar Malaysia, and we are looking into all the local plan uh, of all the five cities, and we are looking into uh, Act 172, that is Town and Country Planning Act, what are the things that the local authorities can use as a, as a law to, to implement uh, low carbon uh, measures into that and how the process of uh, approval to come up with this called Iskandar Low Carbon Society Blueprint 2025. And <clears throat> of course, having done that, um, we were uh, 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 looking into something more detailed. Uh, the reason is because uh, Iskandar Malaysia is the regional authorities. And uh, as a regional authorities, they have a power to facilitate the development, but they, they have a limited power in terms of executive power, uh, especially when it comes to development control. Uh, this is because of the Malaysian constitution that uh, under the Malaysian constitution, land is a state matter. So, so the power is still lies in the mayors of each respective uh, authorities. That's why uh, during this process of strategic projects, we really uh, need to re redirect ourselves again to work out a five separate low carbon society action plan. And you can see that uh, this, this five plan shown here, uh, each have their own uh, different uh, priorities. Like, like for instance, uh, uh, Johor Bahru, uh, we are focusing on uh, city as a vibrant cosmopolis. Uh, in the case of Pulai, we are looking at it in terms of um, smart logistics and uh, Pontian, we are looking at it in terms of biodiversity and agro hub. So uh, we understand that for implementation purposes, this is important and we have to really work with the mayor. This, is an, this slide shows that actually in the process of uh, developing our local community blueprint, uh, Iskandar Malaysia is moving to their master plan too. And this is where the blueprint helped the, the Iskandar Malaysia to come out uh, with the low carbon society uh, blue, uh, blueprint, which helped uh, 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 Iskandar Malaysia, uh, one of the three pillars. Uh, here, uh, of course, there are two pillars apart uh, from uh, the low carbon pillars are the wealth creation and the wealth sharing. But the low carbon society uh, blueprint help us to create or to input into the resource optimization and low carbon pillars for the master plan. And this is also one example of how mainstreaming uh, takes place. Then in terms of implementation, uh, we <clears throat> look into the um, launching of a regional center of expertise. This is one of the uh, UNU uh, initiative, whereby we try to implement the low carbon, uh, low carbon uh, society in terms of low hanging fruits, especially in this program like promoting behavior change in school children. Uh, this is where another important aspect whereby we bring um, Iskana Malaysia uh, LCE and where we have 192 members as a partners. And uh, <clears throat> the promotion of environmental sustainable, environmental sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, education is equally important and because it involves school children uh, in low carbon activities and the school children will be the future generation for Iskandar Malaysia and we hope that they will be the one who will do the, the future planning. Uh, and implement and experience the low carbon society change. <clears throat> uh, this project is interesting because it's a nice example where Kyoto City Hall working closely with, uh, with Malaysian uh, City Hall. And um, they also another NGO where we call KikoNet are also working with our local NGOs. So it's not only the eco partners between city to cities, but between university and universities, as well as uh, between their NGOs. <clears throat> Okay, uh, for Iskandar case, actually, we come up to almost a full uh, cycle. We have prepared 2011 to 2016, their baseline and their, their whole modeling work. And now it's very much more on implementation, uh, uh, monitoring, and the rest. And from this <coughs> work, actually, we have uh, able to extend the experience of uh, Iskandar into other cities. In this case, uh, Colombo. From Post City Hall, actually, work very closely with also uh, researchers uh, from NIES, IGS, uh, and also many uh, input uh, uh, visiting uh, TMG, uh, 
uh, Fujisawa Smart Cities and Kyoto, Kyoto City Hall. In the case of uh, Kuala Lumpur, we are aiming for 70% reduction of carbon intensity by the year of 2030. And you can see the tagline here is 70 by 30, a greener and better Kuala Lumpur. So this is another uh, second case. Uh, we also go through the whole policy scoping. <clears throat> here we started with a vision to be a kind of world-class sustainable cities 2030, looking into SDG, looking into new urban agenda, and then come up with that 10 policies, uh, uh, namely green growth, energy efficient, green mobility, and uh, the rest, including uh, green governance. <clears throat> Of course, uh, actions are not uh, easy to interpret. We need to move into uh, programs. Uh, especially, uh, Bampo pick up seven uh, big sector to take care of it. Transport, building, solid waste, water, energy, infrastructure, and environment. So for instance, transportation, they move to rail system, uh, MRT, LRT, bicycle lane, bus, pedestrian, Building going to green building, uh, sorry, waste into three hour program into uh, incineration, water in terms of river of life, since uh, KL have two important rivers, uh, rainwater harvesting, and of course, uh, same similar energy in terms of energy efficient building, uh, in terms of Euro, NGV, public buses, uh, B10, even now we are talking B20, infrastructure in terms of digital technologies, and environment in terms of open space, tree planting, vertical green and uh, many other programs. Uh, because of time constraint, I'll probably just go into uh, say one, one important program, the GoKL bus, uh, city bus. This is a free bus service, which was designed to function as a feeder bus service and uh, provide the last mile connectivity, integrating other modes. And these are another successful project where we hope to move KL into <coughs> a better motor split and uh, we also hope that uh, in this case, they are using um, bus with uh, NGV or they are using bus uh, with uh, Euro 5 uh, to cut down carbon. Uh, Kolompo is unique because uh, the mayor himself is very committed, uh, Dr. Mahdi himself, uh, trying to accelerate carbon emission, uh, working very closely, uh, even currently working with the uh, Tokyo Metropolitan Government uh, project together with IGS, and uh, <clears throat> they are also working with GCOM, uh, Global Convenience of Mayors, we C40. And uh, we are uh, working um, very closely with IGS, uh, trying to make Kuala Lumpur transition to a zero carbon city and a smart city soon. So these are, these are work that have been done uh, by uh, KL. I'll move to the last case. Uh, this is the Moa district. Uh, case. Uh, this is another uh, unique uh, features uh, because Moa uh, uh, city is the first statutory development plan that incorporate low carbon cities. Uh, I mentioned about Iskandar. Iskandar is the southern part which is next to Singapore. Uh, this Moa is the northern part of Johor. Uh, this is unique because um, they are a royal town. And, and it's, as I mentioned, it's a small, medium-sized cities, about 2,200 to 300,000 population, and most of Malaysian cities are about that. We are trying to explore if this uh, city or district can be going low carbon, and I believe that many of the Malaysian uh, town should be able to do so. So, uh, of course, you can look here, the goal is to be a leading uh, district, economic uh, development uh, for uh, northern region based on heritage, smart technology and low carbon sustainable society. And uh, the mayor are very concerned about this. <clears throat> he have a tagline, so-called MOA to LCS. Uh, two LCS, the two here stand for two L, uh, MOA to be a livable and leading city in terms of low carbon. MOA is going to be a, a competitive and connected city. Uh, MOA is unique because they have uh, very good accessibility in terms of highway. And uh, even we are talking about high speed rail, is one of the station uh, identified uh, earlier. Uh, and then the Moa plan to be a smart, uh, special and sustainable cities because it's a royal town. So I think this is another uh, pride that the mayors are always concerned about. And the uh, policy framework as, as uh, most urban planning, the very important part we look into the global aspect, 
taking consideration into a Paris Agreement, taking consideration in terms of the 45% reduction, the something go, and the national commitment where we are talking NDC, we are talking about uh, the national plan, uh, and at the state or prefecture level, we have to look into the prefecture policies, the structure plan, the uh, sectoral plan, and finally coming out with so-called this MOA 2030 plan. So all these plans need to be really integrated right from the national, global, as well as the state. And uh, here again, we, we did the same modeling uh, using uh, AIMS model and uh, we able to identify. But in the case of MOA, the interesting part actually, smaller cities or small medium-sized cities, we have to take a follow into picture because I think they are no longer so much on energy, uh, CO2 emission, but we have to think about land use change and, and, and uh, this uh, forestry as well as uh, agriculture. So more stage, we have gone through the whole process and now we are now 2021 to 2030, uh, looking more on the implementation and the guideline. So this will be one of the first test case. Uh, since the Secretary did ask me to cover a scenario uh, of COVID, uh, I take this opportunity maybe to uh, quickly go through with you uh, the Malaysian uh, case of COVID scenario. This is a, a picture of two months ago, that's November 2030, where our cases, uh, confirmed cases are still low, about 60,000 uh, people. Uh, Malaysian government, like any other nation, we are still uh, very serious taking uh, action like MCO, we call it Woman Control uh, Order or Quarantine or Lockdown and targeted screening to reduce community infection rate and impact on public health and economy. The, panic, the pandemic, of course, it affects economy, society, and environment. But I think this is an opportunity, I would say that even uh, uh, from Watanabe Sensei's speech, I think this is probably a new normal that uh, we um, planners or even experts should rethink and reflect how we can plan our future cities. Uh, we look into BBB, uh, building better, uh, building back better, or uh, building build back better framework. Where we hope that uh, we will come back stronger and better uh, approach into our planning of the future cities. So uh, the next slide shows today. Uh, this is a few days ago. Uh, the cases double. You can see that uh, two months ago it was only 60,000. 151,000. Today is about 165,000. So you can see that uh, situation is, is bad. Situation is unhealthy. And, and we can see also the affected states are mainly the urbanized states. And uh, daily cases are increasing from 1,500 to about 3,000 and you know, touching even 4,000. So this is something uh, we really uh, need to pay a lot of attention. I think this uh, symposium is important. The negative aspect, uh, I think everybody knows, uh, economic contraction. And uh, the good part, of course, we can see the blue sky and uh, the better air qualities. Uh, Malaysian government actually are quite proactive. We actually, uh, under the Malaysian, uh, Prime Malaysia, uh, Ministry of Housing and Local Government, uh, uh, normally, formerly known as Federal Town and Country Planning, actually they came out with the seven uh, initiatives uh, listed here. Uh, inclusive cities, digitization, healthy cities, neighborhood farming, compact cities, and uh, respond. So uh, if you look from uh, the first initiative, City for Active Mobility, we are looking more on pedestrianization and uh, bicycle network. And if you look at uh, from the uh, uh, park and green spaces, uh, we are working into more green space, more carbon sink, and you are looking for uh, neighborhood planning. Uh, we have actually a better community planning, a 15 minutes walkway, limiting movement within neighborhood. We are looking into even uh, food security, minimizing disruption and food supply. Uh, this is important, I think, especially during the COVID situation. And uh, complexity, uh, this is where we have to rethink about sustainable density. And ultimately, uh, the important part is uh, so-called resilience and uh, climate change. Okay, I, I, I will conclude very quickly. Uh, lesson learned from this collaborative work. Uh, one is um, the cities need a holistic climate change knowledge. And they know that actually 
uh, climate change is not really on mitigation. We have to talk about uh, uh, climate related to disaster. Second point, uh, the benchmarking is important because I think uh, we need to benchmark the best practice. So we need to look into other global cities. The third part is the financial support mechanism. I think climate change is a challenging part. Seems good to COVID. Financial support is important. And uh, fourth is the reporting framework. We need a transparent framework under so-called uh, Paris Agreement. This is important. And finally, the leadership is uh, equally important. With that, thank you very much.